Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, located on occupied ancestral lands of the Muscogee Nation and housed in a building constructed by three formerly enslaved African Americans. My name is Jim Newton, and I am your service associate today. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this space, and some of us are bringing our struggling selves, including pieces we might be ashamed of. All of us are welcome here, and all of us are loved. Some of us already have open hearts, and some of us aren't quite there yet because our hearts have gotten a little beat up this week, and you might have forgotten how to trust and open. Your heart is welcome here, no matter how bruised, we welcome you among us. All of us are imperfect, but we're here to drop our defenses and trust that what happens in worship is powerful and life-giving. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser than when we woke up this morning. We welcome you here. I call your attention to the announcements that are printed on the back of the order of service. Please read these for important information about fellowship life. Spoken announcements will be heard at the end of the hour. On behalf of the members of the fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all visitors who are joining us for the first time and to those of you who still feel like visitors. If you have not already done so, please fill out our visitor book at the front near the greeters or digitally by visiting auf.org slash visitors. You may also contact our minister, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, at minister at auf.org with any questions or concerns you may have. As we prepare for our service this morning, please remember to turn your phone and other electronic devices to silent. Let us move into the service, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Our opening words this morning are from Krista Flanagan. What if everything always went according to plan? At first, we might accomplish more of what we think we need to accomplish. And it may seem less stressful at first, being able to anticipate what happens next. But after a certain amount of time, and the amount would vary from person to person, the once comfortable predictability would become less comfortable and, well, boring. If we always knew what happens next, we lose the surprise, the joy of surprise, serendipitous experience, and the excitement that comes from anticipating the unknown. Friends, let us gather with open, curious hearts, ready to explore the unpredictable, learn from its wisdom, and embrace its beauty. Thank you. 
light our chalice this morning with these words from Barnaby Fetter. We kindle a flame we trust will lead us forward as we travel in unknown lands, where the question, shall I ever get there, resounds. A clear, pure note in every silence. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families separated at our southern border. Yeah. Our opening hymn is number 1002, but we aren't singing today. The congregation is not singing. It's actually 1003, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> Concern or milestone, 
you come forward one at a time and briefly share it into the microphone. To help maintain social distancing, please don't line up, but come forward after the last person has left the microphone. Hi, my name is Jan Newton, and I am proud to say that you're looking at a now certified Starbucks barista. <laughs> and I'm very proud of this accomplishment. I'm still nervous, but my 60-year-old, 61-year-old brain did not work like it did when it was 40 or 20, so it's been extremely difficult to <laughs> memorize all those recipes. But anyway, I'm getting it. <laughs> A delightful joy. You should all go see Hands on a Hard Body. It is a delightful show. You will be so totally surprised and wow, meeting all those characters on stage. Woohoo! And everybody had a beautiful voice. Good morning, everyone. I am celebrating my milestone. It will be awesome to get to the one year that I've been working as a child care worker here. Hey, I'm Billy. Uh, my joy is that we had an awesome work party yesterday for the RE program. Uh, huge shout out and thank you to Brian who's looking at some shelves, to Ken who came in and sorted art supplies. Uh, to Jim Newton, who helped get some of the hardware stuff done, and gigantic thanks to patients running things back and forth. We moved all the stuff between the buildings, uh, and Angela for getting things organized and getting everything out. We're going through stuff, and it's phenomenal. I love organizing, and I love this place, so yay. <laughs> to go to Opelika for the old day and uh, the predominantly African-American community, a lot was going on and I was very encouraged by that as a part of uh, some community work we were doing yesterday and also uh, we were in a public housing community so I was very inspired by that. Some people got some school supplies, even saw some Hispanic families show up yesterday. Very encouraged by that. Thank you. Sometimes you got joy in your heart. Thank you. I'm Andrew, and I uh, talked to Hannah Lester on the phone. Oh, nice. um, some of y'all remember she did the child care when you know when, when Cassidy was here, and then when Hannah was leaving, she trained um, Marjorie's daughter Lauren to mind the kids. And uh, she's doing well, she's in California, but she may visit Alabama before she, uh, her next stage, like moving back to Los Angeles. And, and uh, she says it's interesting and uh, expensive in California. And uh, as far as the climate change, it still feels like a, a, a bubble of safety in one of the freedom states over there. But um, you know, gonna swing back through Alabama and say hi to uh, some of our uh, family and friends over here. Our folks are from Gaston. Yeah. Angie brought me this necklace yesterday, and it says, "Make music great again." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all who shared their joys, concerns, and milestones this morning. May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared aloud and those held in silence, be received into the care and concern of all present. 
Our moment for all ages today is led by our coordinator of religious exploration, Angela Farmer. I'd like to invite anybody who wants to come up here to join us for our moment for all ages. away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. But it followed me. <laughs> but there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit I felt better and happier when it went around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. <laughs> it grew bigger, and we became friends. I showed it to other people, even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly, and many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time, and that it would never become and at first I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do, and it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food, I worked with it, and I played with it. But most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where it could look at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. Oh, that one's upside down. <laughs> I couldn't imagine my life without it. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just part of me. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. What do ideas become? Big things, brave things, smart things, silly things, good things, things like stories, artwork, journeys, inventions, communications, products, and cures. Everything you see around you is once an idea. So what will become of your idea? That is up to you. Please join me in the spirit of contemplation in whatever way feels right with these words from Susan L. Suhaki. Day by day, month by month, year by year, we are confronted with all that we do not know, that we do not understand, that we do not grasp. Sometimes we are humbled by this knowledge and say, it is too wonderful for me to comprehend but I know this universe is more grand and more beautiful than I ever could have imagined. And I give thanks 
for the blessing of being here and seeing, hearing, experiencing, and sensing all that is so wonderful around an enemy. Sometimes we are saddened by this knowledge and say, we need to have the burden of hurt and suffering removed from us. May we have the courage, the wisdom, the fortitude to bear the pain of living. Send us those who will carry our burdens for a short while, and send us those who will comfort us with their healing words and thoughts. Sometimes we're angered by this knowledge and say, in the name of justice and compassion, if it be in our power, give us the strength and ability to right the wrongs, for we do not, nor does any person in the world deserve this. Sometimes we are made joyous by this knowledge, and we say, and we rejoice, cheer for our glorious life. Sometimes we are made curious by this knowledge, and we say, holy and inexplicable is this life. I have no idea what happened or how it happened, but somehow, some way, something changed, and I am free to explore new ways of being. Please let me always continue to search for the unknown in myself and others. The offering that we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something we value. With our gift, freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as tools to empower our mission. To make a donation online via PayPal, please visit auuf.org slash donate. Please indicate in the notes whether your donation is for your pledge or for the offering. If you are writing a check, please make sure your check is able to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge, and drop it in the offering bowl or mail it to PO Box 669, Auburn, Alabama 36831. If this is your first time with us, please allow the offering basket to pass by. Your presence with us is gift enough. The offering will now be gratefully received.
Margaret Fuller. All around us lies what we neither understand nor use, our capacities, our instincts, for this our present sphere are but half developed. Let us confine ourselves to that till the lesson be learned. Let us be completely natural before we trouble ourselves with the supernatural. I never see any of these things, but I long to get away and lie under a green tree and let the wind blow on me. There is marvel and charm enough in that for me. As many of you may remember from last year, question box sermons have become a tradition in Unitarian Universalist congregations around the country. And although it might be tempting to say that these sermons are a day off for the minister because they don't have to do any as much research, <laughs> the realization is that's not correct at all. <laughs> You see, I got a little worried earlier in the week when I had only gotten one question, and I sent out another email, kind of, please send me questions, and boy, did you all respond to that when you found out I really did want your questions. And so, this has been a good sermon for me in that it has required me to go in and research some things that... I didn't know a whole lot about and that um, were very good to think about. Now I will caveat this that not every question will be answered this morning and I don't want anyone to think that that means their question wasn't worthy of being answered. In fact, I'm going to be referring a couple of the questions to other committees to answer for all of us and uh, a following up on a couple. But I tried to get as many as I could in here this morning. And so all of these questions were submitted by someone in the congregation. None of them will be named by me, but you are welcome afterwards to tell everyone that you submitted a question if you like the answer that you got. <laughs> or if you didn't. <laughs> So the first question, I had referred in a sermon last year to interning at a congregation in Louisville that burnt down from fire, uh, First Unitarian Church in Louisville. And this question asks me, we have talked about the fire at the Louisville UU. I'm curious about the cause of the fire. Hopefully we can use it as a learning and fire prevention experience. I'll start off answering this question by saying that when I took UU History and Polity at Meadville Lombard, we had an assignment to do the history of a congregation that we were involved in, either our home congregation or our internship congregation, and report on it to the class. So I heard about 20 histories of congregations this week, and you would be amazed how many of them have caught on fire. A lot. There's some reasons for this, that building churches are often housed in old buildings where the parts have aged, where they might not have been built with electricity in mind in the first place. And it is a reality that many congregations defer major maintenance to next year because it's an easy way to save money in the budget. Now, what I didn't tell you in that sermon last year is that First Unitarian burned down twice. The first time they burned down a year after the building was built, when the late 1800s. I don't know a whole lot about that fire. I do know that afterwards, one of their members, J.B. Speed, who family was extremely wealthy in the Louisville area to the point that the art museum in Louisville is named after him. Um, he donated all the money for them to completely rebuild the building from scratch. 
The one I know more about is the one that happened on Christmas Eve in 1985. Now, the problem with this one is that the cause of the fire was never completely determined. It's not clear if they had a Christmas Eve service that night, if someone left something on that they shouldn't have, or if it was an electrical issue. But the fire did start in the kitchen and it quickly spread to the entire building until all that was left were the brick walls that surrounded the congregation. Now, if you ever happen to be in Louisville, let me know and I'll connect you with someone who can give you a tour of this building because the way they rebuilt it is absolutely marvelous. But the reality is they never got a clear answer on what caused the fire. And as a result, there's still a lot of anxiety in the congregation about fire to the point that the morning the service associate put too much oil in their oil chalice and I lit the chalice and a giant flame shot to the ceiling, I saw lots of big eyes in the congregation. <laughs> I still think there's things we can learn from that fire, though. Most of all, that preventative maintenance of buildings, especially old buildings, is something that we put off at our own risk. Fire and disaster can strike any time. They were in the midst of celebrating calling a new minister. They were not ready for, the, for needing that Christmas to do assessment of loss. And in some ways they become hyper vigilant now in terms of their maintenance. But this is what I'll say. It sh I don't think preventative maintenance should be looked at as a way to save money because even though it's something you don't always get an investment on or that you can't always see an immediate payoff on, it is a safeguard to all of the time, and talent, and money that we have poured into these buildings over the years. So realizing how many, build, how many old church buildings have burned down over the years, my advice to any congregation would be, do your maintenance every year, no matter how much it costs. The second question is a little different one. Um, it asks, I would like to hear your thoughts on the action of immediate witness adopted at GA, the anti-racism and Medicare privatization, as well as the we do not consent on abortion that you reported to us in your email on June 26. But also, if you have any idea why or by what process the Code Red for Humanity Protect the Livable Planet We Love, AIW, wasn't adopted. I thought should, it would, and would be rated top priority what wasn't as far as I could tell, even voted on. Now, this is someone who's followed a lot of technical processes at GA, but I'm about to unpack that for you all. Every year at General Assembly, there are actions of immediate witness voted on. These tend to represent justice issues that uh, different groups and different people feel like need attention from new, new congregations now. They tend to give a moral statement as well as practical steps that can be taken in, um, in addressing this issue. Now, I have very mixed feelings about actions of immediate witness. The process is very flawed. Actions of immediate witness uh, tend to represent issues that are popping up in the news or society at the time General Assembly happens. They're also flawed in the fact that only three can be adopted by General Assembly, no matter how many are proposed. There were eight proposed this year. 
it has been noted by people of color in our movement that this process tends to pit justice issues against each other and make them have to compete for time and support. And for all the effort they require to get adopted and passed, most of them are forgotten by the next year. I, I can't even tell you what the ones that were adopted at the 2021 General Assembly were. I would have to look it up. There's a false sense of urgency and a false ranking of issues that tends to encourage them to be in competition. Now, the reason Code Red, for that person, Code Red for Humanity didn't make it to the voting stage is because the way they decided to whittle the eight issues down to three was to do a poll of delegates. Code Red for Humanity came in fifth out of eight issues in that poll, so it did not move to the voting stage, but it would have been an AIW that proposed action that we can take towards alleviating climate change. It is viewable online if you're curious what it said, and I encourage people to look at it. And although the Commission on Social Witness has said that this doesn't mean the issue isn't worthy of consideration or action, it does mean that some good issues had to be cut out because of that arbitrary number three. But to answer the other part, what do I think of the ones that were adopted? I strongly supported the anti-racism and reparations via restorative justice one. I'm a very big proponent of restorative justice because I believe it may be our best chance to affect systemic change in society by bringing people into dialogue with one another. And I believe that reparations will be needed to make, to make strides towards systemic change. You can't just throw people into freedom and expect the entire system to change it along with them. I also strongly supported that we do not consent uh, rejecting legal challenges to abortion for reasons that I've already sent out to the listserv. I thought it was timely and well thought out about actions needed to protect reproductive rights, and I hope that we'll get to come back to some of those as a congregation in the future. I did support stop the privatization of Medicare, but with some reservations, mostly in regards to the fact that in our current health care crisis, Simply stopping Medicare privatization is not enough. I believe we need a single payer option for everyone and Medicare is just a band-aid on a larger systemic issue. But in the end, I didn't oppose the AIW. And the reason is because as we're trying to get a more just healthcare system, I do not feel like it would be just to strip away Medicare and make even more people suffer. So I can advocate better for systemic change while also trying to prevent the suffering of those who rely on Medicare because privatization of insurance, as anyone who's ever had private insurance can tell you, does not work. Let me tell you about two years ago when my doctor told me I needed a surgery and it was gonna cost $8,000 when I had insurance. Privatization is never the option, at least not in our current climate, because that will always encourage companies to prioritize profit over people. I hope to get back to all three of these in sermons this year, but for now, I'll just say that I did support all three AIWs that were proposed to General Assembly this year, and I hope that we as a congregation won't be like most unions and just forget that they exist, that we will take a look at them and see what can be done, as well as the other AIWs that were not adopted because there wasn't a bad issue in the bunch this year. Question number three is kind of a long one. It's about nature versus nurture. 
Um, this person wants to know about my thoughts on the topic of nature versus nurture. Um, basically, they say, as much as I believe in nurture, when I look at dog breeds, you can see so many traits of the breed, even if the particular dog is not used for that purpose. For instance, a husky who has not pulled a sled would love to pull a sled, a German shepherd who has not trained as a guard dog, or a beagle who has not hunted. Boy, if they get me with that last one, I know all about that. <laughs> as well as medical diseases that are particular to breeds. So they want to know, um, in essence, um, how much nature can build a person and how much control uh, we each have for ourselves through nurture. So when you look at the history of psychology, I think there's often there's often trends that you go through where it's argued that for more nature or more nurture. I think we're currently um, in more of a nurture in many, many fields, although nature is still present. I am going to answer the question a little differently by saying I think it's an entirely false dichotomy. I think each of us is influenced by both nurture and nature. Um, I certainly didn't choose the color of my hair, for instance. I could go out and buy hair dye, but um, that wouldn't change the color of my hair and my, color. my hair would go back to its natural color as soon as it wore out, for example. But there are also inherited diseases um, that are in question. When I was recently working on my family tree and showed it to Calvin, he was amazed by how many people in my family tree have died from cancer. I don't think that's a coincidence, and I don't think there's a whole lot I can do about it other than knowing the warning signs and trying to prevent it. But we also now know that trauma, including racial trauma, is generational. It is transmitted from generation to generation. We're not entirely sure if it's done through genes or if it's the subtle and unconscious actions of the parents who have trauma themselves. But research has shown that children are aware of racism largely before they can even articulate what racism is, especially children of people, of parents who are people of color. Now, people tend to not like to be told that they don't have complete control over their lives. Just look at how many people went to Montgomery and protested a couple years ago when we closed down uh, businesses for a couple of weeks to stop the spread of COVID. But I want to propose that sometimes accepting there are things that we can't change and there are things that we can't might be the first step towards a sort of healing and a sort of transforming of our species. There has been an alternative model proposed called the biopsychosocial model. And what this proposes is that each of us is influenced by biological, by psychological, and by social, uh, by social forces. Biological through the genes, psychological through our unique psychological makeup, such as neurodiversities and trauma and social through the systemic forces in our world and our place in it. And sometimes all three at once. For instance, I could take mental health and show how it's influenced by the biological forces in your brain, by your unique psychological makeup, and by the way that society views those who don't exhibit the best mental health. The key, I think, is figuring out which force is influencing us at any particular time. For instance, I gave the example of mental health that can be influenced by all three. 
So which is the one that we can best influence at that particular time? And what are the ones that we can give support for? This reminds us that our lives are much more complicated than simply free will versus determinism. I can't influence my family's propensity to develop cancer, but I can support cancer research, which may provide more effective treatment, screening, and prevention. And when we can't control the trajectory of our lives, maybe the key is to find meaning in the midst of it and try to make all of our lives better. Our fourth question is a big one, and I'm going to give a caveat that I don't think I can fully answer it in the short space of time that I have, but I hope it will I hope it will give a idea of where we can have more questions going forward. And that is what can our fellowship do to support abortion rights? I won't sit here and sugarcoat it. The situation's dire in Alabama and practically all the states surrounding us. It is looking like it's going to come down to the closest state to us where a woman or a, non, or a pregnant person can get the legal abortion is Illinois. This means that people needing such services may be facing hard choices on how to obtain those services. Now I have been in touch with my colleague in Birmingham who's doing a lot of behind the scenes work. And given that this pulpit is a public stage, I don't want to just come out and name everything that's going on. <laughs> But I will say that I hope our fellowship can be a hub where people can find advice and help when they need it. I would love to see us develop a pantry of condoms, plan B, pregnancy tests, and other reproductive items. In fact, when I was at our cluster meeting in Birmingham the other day, Julie Conradi, my colleague there, showed me this that they're doing condoms with a nice sticker on it saying this church supports sex ed and family planning at all levels. If you need assistance, please reach out to Reverend Julie or the Justice Committee. I want to see us take a risk and become that place where people know that they can get the services they need. And I want us to be ready for when people do need that. Congregations in Illinois are already preparing for the fact that they might have refugees coming from the South looking for assistance. I would like to see us working with those congregations in Illinois to make sure that people get the services that they need. I want us to each find information on the laws in Alabama and our surrounding states because did you know that while abortion is still legal in Florida right now, Governor DeSantis is pushing a constitutional amendment to try to change that. And I want us to educate ourselves on reproductive issues. I heard a lot of uh, people rightfully asking us to bring back Al. And we always had plans to bring back Al. But you know what I didn't hear? I heard it all for the kids. But did you know there's an adult Al program? How many of you have been through the adult Al program? That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what if we educated not just our kids, but ourselves? Because I don't know about you, but I didn't get a very good education on sexual education when I was a kid. I had, I had to figure it all out on my own. And for an evangelical kid in Southern Indiana, that wasn't always the best way to do things. Yes. Loretta is 
Laredo's Fall Con is coming to Birmingham in October. I wonder if we'll have some folks willing to go up and take owl training, including, we, we need children. We need people to do it with the children, yes, but I wonder if any of you all would be willing to get trained to do the adult levels. We must also be willing to play the long game. Abortion opponents waited 50 years to see the fruitation of their efforts to undermine reproductive justice. We must be willing to build a movement that is ready to fight for another 50 years or longer, however long is necessary to restore our rights. And we must be prepared to show up in Montgomery and Washington and put, put pressure on our elected leaders restore people's rights. This isn't an adequate answer, but it's what I have now. And I hope it will be the springboard for continuing conversations. I will confess these next two questions I almost <clears throat> skipped because they both came in really late, but I feel like they're both important questions that I want to try to give at least some answer to in the hopes that they will start conversations. Our fifth question is, how could our congregation grow through improving accountability? I've heard stories over the years where wrongs and injuries have gone unaddressed, leaving members and friends leaving our community with a sour taste in their mouths. How do we address our fellowship trauma as a fellowship? It's a very good and thoughtful question, and that's why when I thought about saying that I didn't have time to think about this one, I didn't want to do that. Because I think that there's an important question there, and that is how do we come back to the table when we've been hurt? Our society doesn't do a very good job in teaching people how to communicate with one another or how to address it when we hurt one another. I think the first thing we can do is become better at learning how to communicate in a way that addresses the trauma, crisis, and conflict behind events. In fact, 10 of you are trained in emotional CPR, which is a program that teaches people how to communicate in a way that is respectful and that addresses emotional conflict. And I've heard some of you say that taking that course was revolutionary. And guess what? You have a minister who happens to be an emotional CPR educator. Some of the people in that tr in those trainings asked me, will we have more trainings in emotional CPR for other people in the congregation? And my answer was, I hope so. But I think we also have to be honest and open both when we are hurting and when we have hurt, we must be prepared to talk to one another and not leave the table. And that's hard because family, family systems theory says that it's easy to go away feeling hurt, feeling distrustful, to cut off the people who have caused you harm. But all that does is let the trauma simmer underneath until it eventually explodes. So this is what I want to propose, is that we must be ready to tell our stories, not just the harms that we felt, but the harms that others have felt. And we must be ready to do that in an honest and open manner. My colleague, Gail Seavey, did a Berry Street essay a few years back where she talked about 
the sexual misconduct that pervaded Union congregations in the 70s and 80s, and how it continues to reverberate through congregations today through secret keeping. Now, I'm not bringing up Gail C. because I believe we have a history of sexual misconduct. In fact, I don't think we do. That's something that we're trained to look for now early in our settlements. But I do think it brings up a good point that if we keep our harms, our conflicts a secret, they don't go away. They just go underneath the surface until something brings them up again. A lot of people come to UU congregations hoping that our progressive attitude will make us more perfect than the places they came from. And unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. We are still just human, and we all still are just figuring out things together. But I hope that we can have conversations that are open and honest about the way that we're affected. Question six is another big one that I will caveat by saying I'm planning on preaching maybe either an entire sermon or an entire sermon series on this in the near future. Is the UU core of beliefs a residual faith after adherence strip away sin, repentance, forgiveness, and renewal? What remains except fellowship or community and how is it different from humanism? That's something I've been thinking a lot about since General Assembly this summer. Because my colleague Michael Slack did the Barry Street essay this year, and Michael was saying the things that we need to stop doing as Unitarian Universalists. And he said one of the things we need to stop doing is saying that you can believe anything and be a Unitarian Universalist. Michael said it was never true, it never has been, and it never will be. There are always boundaries to every community. So I've been thinking about that a lot because we UUs tend to be a bit of a tribal bunch at times. You will find UU Christians and UU pagans and UU humanists and UU Buddhists and UU Muslims and UU Hindus. But we don't, and we'll, we love talking about the Christian or humanist or Buddhist or pagan, or Hindu, or Muslim part of it, but we don't always talk about the UU part of it. I haven't fully thought this through, but I'll tell you where I am at the present. What does make us UU? And where I'm starting is with something that a theology professor, Mike Hogue of Meadville Lombard, once told me. You see, Meadville Lombard did something radical in hiring Mike Hogue. They hired an Episcopalian to teach theology at a UU seminary. And what that did is it meant Mike Hogue didn't always have the same blinders on about theology that some of us do. And what he said one day was something that caused a little bit of outrage in our class. But it's gotten me thinking ever since. He asked, what if we viewed Unitarian Universalism as a way of being religious? Whether you're humanist or Christian or Buddhist or whatever you are, what if we viewed this as a pathway, a way of living, a way of holding values, of holding that which we each hold most dear and make meaning together and do justice together and create community together and prove to the world that while our differences are important, they need not divide us. The idea of Unitarian Universalism being a way of being religious rather than a religion in itself was something that was the part that people in my class didn't quite jump on board with. But you know, 
I think might have a point. What if we viewed ourselves as a pathway, a way of learning how to build a community that values all, to build a way towards beloved community? It's something I'm going to be doing a lot more thinking about this year. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, either if you completely agree or, and on our board, or if you have a lot of objections that you want to give me. Mike wasn't led to the idea either. In fact, after the controversy caused, he decided the final project of the class was either defend or argue against the idea that Unitarian Universalism is a way of being religious. So that's what I'm going to be doing this year. I'm going to be thinking about what is Unitarian Universalism and how can it be relevant in the 2020s? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Our final question that we can get to today, I stuck it at the end if I had time, but I think I'm going to say it whether I have time or not because I think that this person was trying to be a little silly in the question that they submitted to me, but jokes on you, I looked it up. <laughs> the question is, if you're in a vehicle traveling at the speed of light and you turn your headlights on, what happens? <laughs> Well, Professor Philip Gibbs is here to tell you that we don't know because it's a nonsense question. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gibbs says that nothing can travel at the speed of light, so there's no way that your car can be traveling at the speed of light in the first place. So since that's the case, it's a non sequitur to ask what happens if you turn your headlights on. <laughs> And Professor Gibbs, I could tell in his response that he's heard this question a few times because he said some people still persist in asking this question after I give them this answer. <laughs> now he says if you want to know what happens when you're driving at very nearly the speed of light, an answer can be given. Within your car, you have you can observe no unusual effects. You can look at yourself in your rear view mirror, which is attached to you and thus moving with the car. Light from your headlights will always travel at the speed of light in your reference frame. It will strike any object in its path and be reflected back. Everything else will be coming towards you at nearly the speed of light, and so the light reflected from it will be Doppler shifted to very high frequencies towards the ultraviolet or beyond. Or beyond. With a suitable camera, you could take a snapshot. The objects passing would be contracted in length, but because of the different times of passage for the light and effects of aberration, the snapshot would show the objects you pass as it is rotated. I don't think, I think he expected that I would just skip that question. <laughs> As I say, there were more questions, and some of them I will be following up on. So if I didn't get to your question this morning, please don't view it as not being a worthy question. But I will say that what I love about this service is that it gives me a snapshot of what you all are thinking right now. <laughs> Everything from the question about AIWs and churches burning down to the question about the speed of light. So I hope to continue doing this in the future. This was the second annual question box sermon. And what I would say in my closing is don't stop wondering. This doesn't have to be once a year. If you have a question, may it be viewed as something that should be asked. May it be so. Our closing hymn is number 194 in the great hymn, no faith is a forest.
Just a reminder, next week is a gathering, which means it's water communion. If this is the first time you've been a part of this service, I ask that you bring some water with you that's from a place that's meaningful to you. It could be some place you visited this summer. It could be from some place here in the area. It could be from your tap or a swimming pool. We bring our waters and we mingle them back together again to symbolize uh, coming back after our summer, but if you forget your water, we'll have some from the Great Holy Founts of AUUF. But it's best when you can bring your own, because that makes it a little more meaningful. The other thing, one of our neighbors over here asked me to let you... Oh, you want to... Yeah. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. Hi. So great to see you. Um, I live right over there, and um, I'm moving to the East Coast for, to start my PhD program, and I'm giving away a lot of things, um, some gardening supplies, uh, and some interior design, some rose oil, um, organic pesticides, and um, I also have a really big comfortable chair that I'm giving away. <laughs> so if you want to come over and take a look, I'm at 207-1, it's right over there, the brick building. Um, there's also some dry food. Uh, yeah. So I hope to see some of you and have a great summer. Well, I didn't mean to take it off of there, but that'll right. work. So I'm Susan, and I just wanted to remind everybody that we will do an uh, AED familiarization session in like give give me five minutes to just take a break and get it get it ready and I'll be up here near the stage. I'm gonna do that after every Sunday service in August just so people are familiar that we do have an automated external defibrillator here for use when somebody's suffering sudden cardiac arrest and to show you how to operate it. Got a couple things related to the work party we just dealt with. Um, we're looking for someone who has a truck to help pick up some shelves that have been donated. So if you have a truck and are willing to help out with getting shelves, please get in touch with me. Uh, everybody, please save your empty paper towel rolls. We're doing a project and collecting those. Um, and uh, last thing, a while back there was a fundraising project started. I think Connor might have spearheaded it. Uh, where the uh, RE class was making um, uh, laundry detergent. Um, 
we don't currently have anyone doing that, and there's a whole bunch of containers and supplies collected. Uh, so I'm gonna give it like a couple weeks, see if we can find someone who wants to take leadership on that, otherwise we're gonna just ditch the supplies because uh, why keep stuff you're not using, right? <laughs> Just want to remind everybody to be at Hands on Heart Body will be uh, today at 2 and next Sunday at 2. And then it's also on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night at 6 30 p.m. Are you sure there's a matinee today? Oh, maybe you're correct because Carter was saying no, she gets you. It was, she said matinee today. Matinee today, yes. But she needs to rest her voice. She gets Monday and Tuesday off. Please join us now for our song benediction. Okay. Oh, wait, would they ask to sing? Probably not. Probably not. the incomprehensible to our own expectations so that wonder that sense of what is sacred can find space to open up our minds and illuminate our lives amen blessed be and go in peace <laughs> 